today. I'm so glad to be back with you all at this most spectacular of all writers festivals. Jamie has made it happen. And it's imagine I was here last three years ago to give a talk about my new book then, <laughs> Leadership in Turbulent Times. I had chosen that title simply to describe the turbulent times of my guys, as I like to call the presidents that I've waked up with in the morning and thought about them when I go to bed at night. So it was Abraham Lincoln and Teddy Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt, LBJ. Never could I have imagined in January of 2020 when we were here together that that title would be so relevant to describe what we've been through in these last three years. Just think of it, a president, the first in history, who refused to accept the loss a violent attack on the Capitol on January 6th to destroy the peaceful transition of power, a pandemic that would lead to more than a million people dying just here alone and alter our daily lives in ways that it had never been altered since I think the Great Depression swept across the land, a level of social and racial unrest not seen really since the 1960s, a level of Russian invasion of Ukraine, the first large land invasion of a country since World War II, and as we talked about in the panel yesterday, a feeling that democracy is in peril. So nearly everywhere I go, people ask me, are these the worst of times? <laughs> they somehow think as an historian I can answer the question. They're hoping that history will provide an answer. And indeed, good old history does come to the rescue, I will tell you. For history tells us that while these are really tough times that we're living in today, we've lived through really, really tough times before. Civil War, Great Depression, World War II, and in each situation, we emerged with greater strength. And the thing is that we know what the people at the time did not know. We know the end of their story. We know that the Civil War ended with emancipation secured and the Union restored. We know that the Great Depression ended with the mobilization for World War II. We know that the Allies won World War II. But they did not know that. So the people living then lived with the same anxiety that we are living with today. They did not know, as we did not know, what the end of our story would be. But I think that fear and anxiety that we're feeling today should be matched by hope, for it is up to us to write the next chapter of our story. And nowhere, I believe, is more important in writing that chapter than to counter the assault that is being made on one state after another on the right to vote. And that's what I'd like to talk to you about today. For what is democracy in its most basic definition than the right of the people to vote their leaders in or cast them out. Yet while we've taken long pride in our great democracy, for most of our history, it's amazing to realize many of us here today would not be able to vote in other times in our history. At the start, only landowners were permitted to vote, almost exclusively white men and Protestants. When the Constitution was adopted in 1787, the framers could not agree on a national plan for voting, so they left it up to states to decide what to do. And mostly the states were run by these same old white landowners who wanted only themselves to be able to vote. New Jersey was, this is a really interesting thing that I didn't know when I was thinking about all this. New Jersey was the only state that didn't specify that voters had to be male. So over a very short time, women were allowed to vote in those very early days until they figured out they didn't want them there. But it was very fleeting. When George Washington was elected in 1789, only 6% of the population could vote. Then that voting population expanded a little bit in the decades that followed when the requirement for owning land was undone. Then you got the 15th Amendment in 1870, allowing African American men, but not women, to be granted the right to vote. But by the late 1870s, discriminatory practices were put in place all throughout the South, literacy tests and voting tests, to prevent blacks from exercising that right to vote. And sadly, we see these efforts to restrict these votes in the same places today once again. So then the fight for extending the right to vote went to women. And that did not come easily or swiftly. It took nearly 100 years of marching and protesting, lobbying, and even jail time for some of the brave women suffragettes before public consciousness decided that it was time for women to get the right to vote. And the 19th Amendment was finally ratified. With public sentiment, old Abraham Lincoln once said, nothing can fail. Without it, nothing can succeed. And he meant something more than the transient public opinion. He meant when a settled feeling comes across the country, the ideals of the country have to be changed, and they will. So what I'd like to talk about today is how we should ex be expanding the right to vote, 
not restricting it. Get that settled feeling in the country, which will mean that it can no longer be under assault. Today in state after state, laws are being passed right now to make it harder to cast ballots, to limit the number of drop-in boxes, to reduce the idea of being able to have mail and voting, to demand voter IDs in a purported attempt to prevent some fraud that nobody has ever proved is happening. So I believe that right to preserve and protect and expand voting is the fight of our lives. If I were young, I'd be out on the streets arguing for this. So I'm here talking to you instead about it so that we can do this together. And for me, it has a deep personal resonance. Both the president I worked for, Lyndon Baines Johnson, and the man I married, Richard Goodwin, played central roles in our country's last great triumphant battle to expand voting rights. And that was the passage of the 1965 Voting Rights Act in the wake of events in Selma, Alabama. And that Voting Rights Act has been called the most single, most effective piece of legislation ever passed by the Congress. So this morning, I'd like to tell you a story about how Lyndon Johnson, a Southerner, who is, knew that his closest friends would feel that he had betrayed them by coming out for voting rights, formed an alliance with the Civil Rights Movement to reach this historic moment, and how my husband, Richard Goodwin, was deeply involved, and how these two men, LBJ and Richard Goodwin, who happened to shape my career as a presidential historian, LBJ, my husband shaping my life, and the course of our history, were aligned to try and bring our country closer to our ancient ideals. I first met LBJ, as some of you know, when I was 24 and selected as a White House fellow. I worked for him a year in the White House and then accompanied him to his ranch to help him on his memoirs. It's amazing to remember that when he first asked me to come down to the ranch and work on his memoirs, I hesitated. I was looking forward to returning to Harvard. I wanted to begin my teaching career. I wanted to write. So I told him that I, I didn't think I could go. He said, hell, so you want to teach? You can teach me. I can teach you. You want to write? I'll get you a cabin on the lake. Don't you writers like to have the, them to look out a blue sky and a cabin on the lake? You'll have one of those. Y you want boyfriends? I'll invite millionaires every weekend. You want to travel? I think I'll be traveling around the world. You can come with me. So what, what girl in her right mind would want to come and work for the President of the United States under these circumstances? The presidency, it'll be your field. And for some reason, though, I had this feeling that if I was there full time, he was such a formidable character that I needed some distance from him because I knew how he had been able to overtake so many other people. And I also missed my friends, and I wanted to go back to Cambridge. So I said, could I come part time? I could come on weekends. I could come on vacations. No, he said, it's all or nothing. So I almost missed this chance, except that what happened is on January 19th, the day before he was about to leave the presidency, he called me into the Oval Office. Everything was being moved around. When, when they start moving in the new people, it feels like it's a renovation of a, of a building that's happening while you're still in it. Only the Oval Office was intact. And he just, I walked in the door and he said, okay, part time. I need help, whatever you can do. Will you do it? Of course I will, I said. Now he said, take care of yourself up there at Harvard. Don't let all those people poison your feelings toward Lyndon Johnson. Then he said, it's not easy to get the help you need when you're no longer on the top of the world. I know that. I will not forget what you are doing for me. So for the next three years, I spent long weekends and vacations at the ranch. And I was luckily assigned to work on two chapters of his memoirs, one on civil rights and the other one on the Congress, the things that made him very happy. So he wanted to talk to me all the time, reminiscing about these things. So he talked. He talked when we swam in his pool. Well, we didn't really swim in his pool because there were so many rafts with floating notepads and floating telephones on them so he could work in the pool that you could hardly maneuver around the pool. We talked as we sat in the movie theater waiting for a movie to come forward. He would stay right awake when there was a documentary on Lyndon Johnson in the South or Lady Bird traveling somewhere. And then the minute the movie came, he'd fall asleep because he couldn't talk and he, couldn't, he didn't want to be awake if he couldn't talk. He never stopped talking. He talked as we went around the ranch. I remember one particular time in, re in reality, we would talk in his car when he would just show everybody the sights of the ranch. And then one day we were in a car and we were at the top of a hill and, we, and it was a new car that we hadn't used before and we were going down toward the lake. And the Secret Service agent just sort of whispered to him, just be careful, the, the brakes just needed a little fixing. So we go down the hill and we sort of end up in the water. And I'm, and I'm supposed to be afraid, but I wasn't somehow because he was there. It was an amphibious car, so that was the whole idea, that he loved playing that game. But then he said to me, what is wrong with you Harvard people? Why aren't you afraid? You're supposed to be afraid. 
Anyway, we talked and we talked and we talked. And then as time marched on, and as his physical strength began to ebb in those years, he began to talk with me more and more about his early life, conversations that gave me insight into the man who surprised the country by becoming a champion of civil rights and voting rights, economic opportunity, and social justice. As a small boy, he identified with the political ambitions of his father, Sam, who was a progressive Democrat in the state legislature of Texas. Night after night, when Sam would sit on the porch with his cronies, drinking beer and swapping tails, LBJ as a little kid would stand in the shadows in the background, straining to understand the vivid language, loving to hear the inside view of politics. If you can't go into a room, his father would tell him, and see right away who is for you and against you, you don't belong in politics. So like his father, young Lyndon would strike up conversation with everyone in town he met. He became a favorite of older women. He would ask them, what did you do today? How are you doing? How are you feeling? And he became interested in their lives. And then when he saw a group of men walking on the street or talking, he would stand on the sidelines smitten with the idea of politics. At 10, he took a job at the local barbershop so that he could learn about politics and current events from all the men who were talking about it there. And he loved going with his father to the state house and watching the activity on the floor. But nothing he loved more than traveling with his father on the campaign trail. They would bring bread and jam and they would stop in every farmhouse along the way and ask people how they were and Lyndon felt he was in heaven. Well, these trips also offered relief for him, for both the father and son, from the family troubles at home. There were long stretches of time when there was little money, when the crops failed. His father tended to drink so much, too much at times. There were arguments between his mother and his father raging. Rebecca Johnson, his mother, had grown up in a middle-class family with a house that had a white picket fence around it. She was the daughter of a college-educated lawyer, and she herself had graduated from Baylor University at a time when few women were able to do that. She aspired to be a writer, so she worked as a journalist for her family newspaper when she interviewed the dashing young Sam Johnson. A whirlwind courtship followed, leading to a strange new life suddenly in a small cabin where Sam spent half the night drinking and swapping tales with his cronies. She said the first year of her marriage was the hardest year of her life. There were no books, no culture, no one to talk with. But then baby Lyndon came along, and she was happy. He learned the alphabet at two, she wrote in her little memoir. He could read and spell before he was four, and he would like to recite long passages from Tennyson and Longfellow when he was four years old. It's hard to imagine little Lyndon doing this. But opposite the beaming side of that man, she loved him when he, when he was, t whenever he read books, he, she said, he said, told me, or whenever he recited poetry, she loved him. She would hug him so hard he could hardly breathe. But then opposite that beaming side of the moon was a darker side, an insecurity that would plague Lyndon all of his life. When he failed to fulfill his mother's ambitions, when he was restless in school or a sluggish student, she wouldn't talk to him. She ignored him. When he refused to continue violin and dancing lessons, she would pretend he no longer was there. When he refused to go to college, she withdrew her love. She would simply uh, talk to the other siblings as if Lyndon had already left. In later years, sadly, Lyndon would exhibit a simple, similar pattern in dealing with those who he was close to. It earned him the epithet. When he got mad, he would simply freeze out them, freeze them out. I had that happen to me one time when I didn't go to the ranch. And before that, I would always be in the front of the car when he was taking dignitaries around the ranch. It could be the, you know, the premier of, of a country or Dean Rusk or a cabinet member or Gregory, Gregory Peck. And he'd say, look, Doris, look at the jumping antelope. Look, Doris, look, that's the house where I was born. But then after I didn't go one weekend because I was with a boyfriend, I was in the back of the car. And he's saying, look, Dean, look at the jumping antelope. Look at this. I felt like I was in Siberia. And then I thought, this is wrong. This is why I can't work for him full time. He can't have that power over me to exert that kind of power. But he finally got to San Marcos State Teachers College and he made his mother happy. And he made up for lost time. He moved very quickly. He decided that the way to get ahead was to get close to people in power. And the way to do that, in his view, was to get close to the president of the university. Well, the school had a policy of part-time work, and he was assigned to a janitorial crew outside picking up trash. So he imagined himself in a race to pick up the most trash in the least number of minutes of all the other people that were picking up trash. 
and his eagerness earned him a promotion to go inside to the janitorial crew, and he asked if he could be part of the crew that mopped up the floor right outside the president's office. So soon he was talking to the president, of course. The next thing you know, he's the messenger for the president. The next thing you know, he's the assistant to the president. The next thing you know, the president has invited him to have a room in the garage above his house and considers Lyndon the only son he had never had. And then he becomes a power behind the throne of the college. Well, the first time his raw ambition became harnessed, however, to a larger purpose came when he took a year off from the State Teachers College. He needed money to continue on. And he became a principal and a teacher at a small little Mexican-American school in Catula, Texas, at the border of Mexico. He saw the pain, he said later, of the prejudice on those kids' faces who came to school without anything to eat, who knew that people disliked them and he couldn't figure, they couldn't figure out why. He invested half his first year's salary into school equipment for them to be able to play games. His students adored him and his teachers admired him and that experience left an indelible mark on his life, as you will see later on. So after college, he got a job as a chief of staff for Richard, Richard Clayburgh, a wealthy rancher in Texas who had just won a seat in Congress. So he goes to Washington for the first time, he sees the Capitol Dome, and he says, I'm gonna be a congressman someday. And then he says, there was a smell of power in Washington, a smell, I could smell it. I, every time I go there, I keep wondering, what is this smell that he smelled? But it was the smell of power. So anyway, no sooner does he get settled in this Dodge Hotel where all the congressional secretaries happen to live, than he begins his quest to find the best mentor to tell him the ways of getting around Washington, teach him the ropes of the game. So in order to meet the maximum number of people that he wanted to, he would go into the bathroom, the common bathroom, and brush his teeth five different times at 10 different uh, intervals of minutes. And then he would take four separate showers, keep coming in and coming out, so that he figured I can meet the most people and find out who the best mentor is. And in six months' time, young Lincoln, young Lincoln, I get my guys mixed up, young Lyndon, would know how to operate Washington better, they, an old timer said, than anybody who'd been there for 20 years. <clears throat> and Clayburg's office de developed the reputation as one of the most efficient on Capitol Hill. He was hard to work for, however. It was said that when, um, when he was found, uh, one of his um, staff members, he only had three for Clayburg at that time, writing a letter to his mother or taking a crap, he would say, can't you do that on your own time, son? <laughs> And there's another occasion when one of the aides, um, they had a rule there that every letter that came into the congressional office had to be answered the day it arrived. So one of the, two of his aides decided one night they'd finished all their jobs. They told him they were going to go to the movies, but they'd check back in later. He found a letter that was unanswered. He went running into the movie theater and got them out of the movie. He said, this letter, it's unanswered. And they pointed out to him that actually he had asked them to put it aside because he himself wanted to answer it. So he said he was sorry. <clears throat> he went then and he brought them to dinner. They had no sooner started the dinner. I guess I should have a glass of water, which is a second. I think it's floating down here. Oh, it's supposed to float here. Ta -da. Thank you. Perfect. <clears throat> he, he only had <clears throat> there. He only had like two minutes for them to eat and then they went back to work. But the amazing thing is that Clayburg's office was so efficient, as I said, that it set, so, it set sides for everybody else. He somehow made these people feel part of a team and that's gonna be the key to him the rest of his life. So then what happens is he hears that F FDR has created this new organization, the National Youth Administration. And even though he's only r ruled three people in his staff, he applies for the job. And Sam Rayburn, the Speaker of the House, is so impressed by his enthusiasm that he makes him the youngest director of the NYA in the entire country. And once again, he's so excited at what he's doing. He's getting young people to work on the jobs. He treats his staff difficultly, and they love what they're doing. And Eleanor Roosevelt thinks that he's the best NYA director in the country. So then he decides it's time to go to Congress. He's only 29 years old. And he hears that the current congressman has died. That first day that he hears that, he decides that he's going to go out and announce that he's gonna be the congressman. <clears throat> Even though his, um, the widow of the congressman was going to run for the job, but he beats her to the job. And then once he gets there, he dreams that he's going to bring electricity to his beloved hill country. And somehow persuades FDR, who he has met 
when he just became a congressman, because FDR was on a fishing trip, came through Texas, and he so impressed FDR in his first talk with him that FDR invited him to go on a state train with him throughout Texas, and he comes away, FDR does, and he says, Oh, thank you very much, sir. I will pick it up. Ta -da! He says, I've just met the most remarkable young boy, he says to his staff, and I want you to help him in every way you can. And then there's a photo that's taken of FDR and the state governor and, and Lyndon Johnson, and he was able at, to Photoshop the governor out of that photo, and he sent it around <laughs> to his entire, he must have known how to do that in an earlier day. So he becomes FDR's guy, and he, and he becomes a very effective congressman. But then something happens to his ambition along the way. He reached out for a Senate seat in 1941, and he lost. And he felt it really as a referendum on his self-worth. He interpreted it as something that I could never happen again. So he decided that the reason he had lost was that Texas had grown more conservative, and he was, uh, he was representing the whole state. So he clipped his progressive wings, and he drifted away from the New Deal, drifted away from FDR, and he was able then finally to win an election in the Senate in 1948. But the drive for wealth then became a dominant impulse in his life. He built a multi-million dollar radio empire, and he lost his sense of purpose and his desire to make a difference. So what happened as he climbed the ladder, however, he was doing extraordinarily well. He became minority whip, he became minority leader, he became majority leader in the Senate, the most powerful majority leader in the history of our country. But still, he was out without that ambition for doing something good that had been with him in those early days of his life. He placed winning and holding his position above everything else, a syndrome, I think, that's all too often we're seeing in our country nowadays. And then the kaleidoscope turned. In his 40s, he suffered a nearly fatal heart attack, and he fell into a deep depression. He sort of just lay there in the hospital, they said. It was almost as if he weren't there. They couldn't rouse him from a corpse-like state. And then all of a sudden, one day, he came back. He said, get me shaved. I'm ready to go. Keep going. The whole hospital awakened. He later said, what happened? He said, I was lying there, and I was thinking, what if I died now? What would I be remembered for? He had laid a foundation for a substantial fortune. He'd become the most effective majority leader in the country. But to what end these purposes? So he decided that he was going to change. Something was going to be different. When he returned to Congress, he dedicated himself to the values that he had originally been used when he went into public service. The idea that government should be used to help people to, who needed help, the poor and the elderly and the sick. The idea that we have to look after people. His father said when he first was in, in the state legislature, we have to look after our people. That's what we're here in politics for. With that vision, he committed himself as soon as he got back to the Senate to pass the first civil rights bill in 57 years since Reconstruction. It was a compromise bill. It provided only minimal protections for civil rights and voting rights. But it showed that the Senate could do something. And he said, if we show we'll do something, we'll be able to do something again, I promise you. And so it turned out he was able to keep that promise. The kaleidoscope turned again, and he was taken from the misery of the vice presidency into the presidency when JFK was murdered. Just imagine the situation he faced in 1963 the shocking assassination of Kennedy and the murder of Oswald had been seen by people on their television screens all across the nation. There was speculation of a conspiracy <coughs> from Russia, China, or the Mafia. And at that same moment, despite the courage and leadership of the civil rights movement, JFK's signature civil rights bill to end segregation in the South was absolutely stuck in the Senate with no hope of passing a filibuster. And if it failed, there was fear of widespread violence in the streets. And meanwhile, none of JFK's other legislative proposals had gotten through in what was considered then a broken Congress, an echo of today. So the main chance that LBJ had to show that he had taken the reins of power, there was a fear, could he really make this transition happen, was to make that stalled legislative machinery work so that that civil rights bill could come to the floor and then everything else would be loosened up after that. So he made the extraordinary decision to make civil rights his number one priority. His advisors warned against this. You'll never get it past the filibuster. You'll get no bills through the Congress. You'll go to your own election 11 months later as a failed president. You only have a certain amount of currency to spend as president. You must not spend it on this. 
But then he famously said, then what the hell is the presidency for? So he set to work in those first six months. He defied con completely convention, and he brought every single congressman and two congresswomen, that's all there were right then, to the White House in groups of 30 so that they could have dinner with him and their spouses. So few times are social engagements, intimate social engagements, used by a president in the people's house to make that kind of connection intimately with congressmen and senators. And then Lady Bird would take all of them on a tour of the White House while he would have port and brandy with the guys. And then all day, never did he stop calling the congressmen and the senators. He would call them at 6 a.m., he would call them at 6 p.m., he would call them at midnight. He even called a senator at 2 a.m. He said, I hope I didn't wake you up. And then the senator said, oh no, I was just lying here hoping my president would call, looking at the ceiling, hoping my president would call. And in those days before transparency, you could make deals. So when he knows that he knew that he needed Everett Dirksen, the minority Republican leader, to bring the Republicans to m match the Democrats, because that party was cut in two, he did everything he could to reach Dar Dirksen. What would you like, Dirksen? You want trips for me, for Peoria, Springfield, I'll be there. You want appointments, you want dams, you want bridges, anything you want. But then he knew that Dirksen also wanted, like he did, to make a difference. So he said, Everett, you come with me on this bill, and 200 years from now, you bring some Republicans to join us and break that filibuster. 200 years from now, school children will know only two names, Abraham Lincoln and Everett Dirksen. <laughs> How could Dirksen resist? He brought 22 Republicans to join the 44 Northern Democrats to break the filibuster and bring that civil rights bill to the floor where its passage changed the face of our country. It outlawed that legal system of segregation that had lasted for 75 years in the Deep South, those Jim Crow laws that had prohibited blacks from entering white-only restaurants, sharing drinking fountains, bathrooms, movie theaters, sports arenas, hotels, overnight the new law of the land would erase the indign indign indignities of that deep-seated system of segregation. But the one issue that the Civil Rights Act did not address was voting rights. It took the vision and the courage of Martin Luther King and the Civil Rights Movement to bring that issue to the forefront of the American conscience. On what became known as Bloody Sunday, more than 500 peaceful demonstrators were crossing the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, Alabama on their way to the Capitol in Montgomery, a 54-mile trek to protest the right to vote. And as we've all seen in the replays of this video over and over again, the Southern registrars had decided that they were not going to allow this to happen. All sorts of devices had been keeping these people from voting for so many years. And here was the march to protest that, and suddenly a group, a whole troop of Alabama state troopers came onto the orderly lines of protesters. They knocked them to the ground, bludgeoned them with nightsticks, and then men on horseback followed the retreating crowd. Many were hospitalized, including John Lewis. I was 22 that Sunday, that bloody Sunday, watching those ominous events on television while I was a grad school, graduate student at Harvard. I was anguished like millions of others. For days, we talked of little else, wondering what we could do. That vicious assault had revealed something ominous about our country, something so different from the hopefulness that I had experienced not too long before, in August of 1963, when I happened to be, luckily, at the March on Washington with the Civil Rights Movement. I remember the nervous excitement I felt that morning. We were told that there was a state of emergency in Washington that um, hospitals were canceling all elective surgery for fear of mass casualties. Liquor stores were closed. All retail stores were closed. Washington's national game, the Washington Nationals, was postponed. More than 2,500 National Guardsmen had been mobilized to bolster the D.C. police force. And yet, 250,000 strong, it was the most peaceful march in history. I remember picking up my sign at the Washington Memorial. It said, Catholics, Jews, and Protestants unite for civil rights. We marched toward the Lincoln Memorial. We swayed to the soaring rhetoric of Martin Luther King. We clasped hands and raised our, our, our signs to the air and sang at the end, we shall overcome. I was lifted by the most joyful day of public unity and community that I had ever experienced in my life until that point. And now Bloody Sunday, in opposition to this, had revealed something so ugly, so diametrically opposed to the togetherness of that day in Washington. And yet, a chain of events was set in motion that would leave a permanent impact on the course of history. The conscience of the people was inflamed, and the fire from that torch rose from the people to the highest seat of power in the White House. Eight days later, 
my friends and I were huddled together once again to listen to LBJ make an impassioned speech to a joint session of Congress to call, demand the right for votes. Little could I have imagined as I listened to that speech that three years later I would be working directly for Lyndon Johnson, even though I'd been involved in the anti-war movement, even though he knew I'd written an article against him which said how to remove Lyndon Johnson from power, <laughs> even though he said bring her down here for a year and if I can't win her over, no one can, that I would end up working for him. Nor could I have imagined, more importantly, that destiny would lead me to meet and marry Richard Goodwin, the chief White House speechwriter who crafted the words of that beautiful address, which became known simply as the We Shall Overcome speech, considered one of the most powerful and important speeches in the 20th century. So now let me take you into the room where all of this happened. LBJ had decided on a Sunday night, a week after Bloody Sunday, that he would go before a joint session of Congress to demand the right to vote would be on Monday night. My future husband was at Arthur Schlesinger's that Sunday night at a party, drinking and having cigars. He was up late, he went home. There was no word for him to come into the White House, so he figured somebody else is writing the speech. He got in the next morning around nine o'clock, and Johnson is roaming around the White House saying, how's Dick Goodwin doing on that speech? And Jack Valenti, who was his aide, who was the only one who was in the White House that Sunday night, had given it to another person to write. So LBJ raged, you get Dick Goodwin to write that speech. Well, over the past year, Dick had become his chief speechwriter. It began in a curious way. In March of 1964, Dick had just worked for, LB, for JFK. JFK had died. He wasn't quite sure what he was going to do. There were some rumors out that he might be able to go to work in the White House. But it all came down to a taped conversation that I finally found from Bill Moyers and Lyndon Johnson. Lyndon Johnson is saying to him, we need somebody that can work here. We need somebody who's a wordsmith. We had Sorensen for a while and he's left. I need somebody who can put phonetics into my speeches, get rhythm into my speeches. So Maury said to him, well, the only person I know who can do that is Richard Goodwin, but he's not one of our little circle. There were already there these kind of cross lines between the Kennedy people and the Johnson people, but I know he's the one who can do it. Why don't you just ask him? Ask him if he, well, they were doing a, a war on poverty statement at that time. Ask him if he put a little rhythm into it, a little sex into it, a little Churchillian phrases to it. Rhythm, sex, Churchillian phrases. It all sounds crazy. And you hear it on the tapes. It's so amazing. But ask him to do it in confidence. Just call him tonight. Tell him I'm already impressed with him. I know what he did for Latin America with JFK. See how he's getting along. See if he can put a music into it. So he did ask him, he wrote that, he wrote one more, he wrote the Great Society speech, and then eventually he became the main speechwriter. But what it meant because of that screw up the night before was he had only that day to write this extraordinary speech. So he's in his office and everybody outside is raving, raging around, how quickly can he do it? And he turns out one typed page after another. It goes to the secretaries, it goes to Lyndon Johnson. He never even was able to finish it in time for the whole thing to be put on a teleprompter. And only LBJ knew that we cannot pressure him. He knew what, what enormous pressure he was under. So they left him alone. LBJ only called him once. And he said, Dick, I'd like to talk a little bit tonight about Ketula. And my husband knew immediately, my future husband knew immediately what that meant. Because in those, those days, the White House speechwriters were right in the West Wing. There were only a few of them. There weren't a whole team right now as they are in the executive office building. So he spent many hours. He'd been at the ranch. He knew Lyndon Johnson well. So. Finally, we're listening to that speech. I'm now with my friends once again in our crowded dorm room. Living rooms all around the country are listening, and the president began to speak. I'd love to just read this to you because I'd love it. It's so beautiful. I speak tonight for the dignity of man and the destiny of democracy, he began. What a, a glorious opening. It's amazing, right? I, mean, it's, I couldn't write that if my heart depended on it. At times, he said, history and fate meet at a single time in a single place to shape a turning point in man's unending search of freedom. So it was in Lexington and Concord, so it was at Appomattox, so it was in Selma, Alabama. There is no Negro problem, there is no Southern problem, there is no Northern problem, there is only an American problem, and we are met here tonight as Americans to meet that problem. Not as Democrats, not as Republicans, we are met here as Americans to meet that problem. Our fathers believed that if this noble view of the rights of man was to be flourishing, it must be rooted in democracy. The most basic right of all in a democracy is the right to choose your own leaders. The history of this country in large measure is the history of the expansion of that right to allow all of our people to vote. 
Many of the issues of civil rights are very complex and most difficult, but about this issue, voting rights, there should be no argument. Every American citizen must have the right to vote. There is no constitutional issue here. The command of the Constitution is plain. There is no moral issue. It is wrong, deadly wrong, to deny any of your fellow Americans the right to vote in this country. There is no issue of states' rights or national rights. There is only the struggle for human rights. But even if we pass this bill, the battle will not be over. For what happened in Selma is part of a far larger movement which reaches into every section and state of America. It is the effort of American Negroes to secure for themselves the full blessings of American life. And their cause must be our cause too. For it is not just Negroes, but really it is all of us who must overcome the crippling legacy of bigotry and injustice. And then he paused and he repeated the phrase, and we shall overcome. As we heard Lyndon Johnson take up the anthem of the civil rights movement, we jumped to our feet. The President of the United States had just linked the immense power of his entire administration in support of the civil rights movement. The real hero of this moment, Lyndon Johnson continued, is the American Negro. It's his actions, his courage to risk safety and even risk his life to awaken the conscience of a nation. And then finally, he came to Catula. My first job after college, he related, was as a teacher in Catula, Texas, in a small Mexican-American school. Few of them could speak English, and I couldn't speak much Spanish. My students were poor, and they often came to class without breakfast. They were hungry, and they knew, even in their youth, the pain of prejudice. They never seemed to know why people disliked them, but they knew it was so, because I saw it in their eyes. I often walked home late in the afternoon, after the classes were finning, finished, wishing I could do more. But all I knew was to teach them the little I knew, hoping it might help them against the hardships that lay ahead. And somehow you never forget what poverty and hatred can do when you see its scars on the face of a young child. I never thought then, in 1928, that I would be standing here in 1965. I never even occurred to me in my fondest dreams that I might have the chance to help the sons and daughters of those students and help people like them all over this country. But now I do have that chance, and I'll let you in on a secret. I mean to use it. I have that power, and I mean to use it. By the end of the speech, my friends and I were in tears, and so I learned from Dick was he standing at the back of the well that night. And later we heard the tears had rolled down the face of Martin Luther King in Selma, Alabama. And four months later, that historic Voting Rights Act was voted into law. And, yeah. and, and 10 years later, 10 years later, I would marry Richard Goodwin, the man who had crafted those words. There was a buzz of excitement one day when I was at my office at 78 Mount Auburn Street. I was a young assistant professor at Harvard. And we heard that Richard Goodwin was coming to take an office to finish a book. We knew who he was. We knew he'd worked for, uh, for JFK. We knew he'd worked for Lyndon Johnson. Um, we knew he was mercurial and brash. We heard he was arrogant. We heard he was charming, but kind of a crazy character. He walked in, and, and, and everybody was excited. He was there. I, my office was upstairs. And he came upstairs, and he just plopped himself down on a chair in my office. And he said, so, you're a graduate student, right? He said, no, I'm an assistant professor. I teach this, and I teach that. He said, I know, I know. I'm just teasing you. So then we talked about Lyndon Johnson. We talked about the Red Sox. We talked about Boston. We talked about our lives. We went to dinner that night. And I knew at the end of the night that I had met the man I want to marry. It was love at first sight in many ways for me. And it took a little while. And it turned out for him as well. Well, so. For more than four decades, a photograph of Lyndon Johnson shaking Dick's hand as he handed him the pen for the signing of the Voting Rights Act hung on the walls of his study until he died. And I've now brought that picture with me to my home in Boston, where it hangs right in the foyer of my home, where I can see the public park in the commons of Boston, a reminder of one of the proudest moments in his life and the life of Lyndon Johnson. Well, 10 months before Lyndon Johnson died, he suffered a second heart attack. Though he had managed to survive, his days were filled with pain. An oxygen tank near his bed helped him somewhat, but not enough. But then in December of 1972, he was scheduled to speak at a big civil rights symposium at, in Texas, in Austin. All the leaders of the civil rights community would be there. 
but he was up the night before with terrific pains in his chest. The doctors insisted you cannot go. There was an ice storm. He decided he had to go. His driver was driving. The driver was driving too slowly. He had not driven the car for six months, but he took over the wheel to get to Austin in time. Lady Bird said he knew the life force that he was, he was wasting and spending, but he had to spend it on this. He struggled to reach the lectern when he got to there. He paused to put a nitroglycerin tablet into his mouth. He spoke haltingly, but with great passion. While admitting that civil rights had not always been his priority, he had come to believe that the essence of democracy lay in ensuring that all Americans play by the same rules and the same game against the same odds. I don't want this symposium to spend time talking about what we've done, he said. We haven't done nearly enough. But if our will is strong and our hearts are right, we shall overcome. This would be his last public statement. Five weeks later, he suffered a fatal heart attack and he died. He was only 64 years old. Well, several years ago, I returned to the hill country of Texas to revisit Lyndon Johnson's ranch, now transformed into a national park. As I retraced the road that I had often marked with the president, going past his birth house, his grandfather's place, his first school, I stopped at the stone wall surrounding a grove of massive oak trees beneath which is the Johnson family cemetery. There's a simple red granite headstone there that reads Lyndon Baines Johnson, 1908 to 1973, 36th president of the United States of America. Below the inscription sits the presidential seal. Standing there once again, I recall the day that he pointed out to me this very plot where he intended to be buried. Here, he said, is where my mother dies. Here's where my daddy is buried. And here is where I'm going to be buried someday too. And then he expressed to me the hope that if he were ever to be remembered in a positive way, he knew the war in Vietnam had cut his legacy in two, that it would be for civil rights and voting rights. This emotional visit to the ranch, seeing the pool where I swam with him every day, seeing the bedroom where I stayed while I worked at the ranch on the memoirs, the dining room where we came together for meals, brought into focus the unique privilege offered me at the age of 24 by this aging lion of a man, a victor in a thousand contests and yet roundly defeated in the end by the war in Vietnam. He was by turns serious, funny, profane, vulnerable, sage, insistent, raging, despondent, telling stories that were a revelation that I did not then realize were formative in igniting my career as a presidential historian. In my lifetime of studying presidents, I have found that the judgments of history are neither immediately rendered nor are they set in stone. From today's vantage point, it is increasingly apparent that over the passing decades, even though the loss and lingering pain of the Vietnam War will never go away, we have gained a new perspective from which to reconsider Lyndon Johnson, and in particular, to reevaluate the enduring aspects of his vision on civil rights, voting rights, economic opportunities, social justice. His bipartisan domestic achievements are still with us all today. Medicare, Medicaid, aid to education, immigration reform, NPR, PBS, aid to the cities, and much, much more. But what history also shows us is that we cannot take for granted the strides that we have made forward. Progress is not a straight line, and nor is it everlasting. One thing is unyielding, however, and that is in a democracy, as LBJ said, the right to vote is the basic right without which all others are meaningless. It gives people, as individuals, control over their own destinies. And now it is us, up to us, the living, to continue that quest for equality human dignity, which is under siege across our land. One of the last things my husband wrote months before he died spoke to this challenge. We may be in a time of darkening anxiety now, he wrote, of growing rage and ugliness, but the one thing that a backward look into the oscillations and vicissitudes of our country suggests is that massive and sweeping change will come. Whether or not it is healing or inclusive, change depends on us. It will not come from the top, it will not come from a president. As ever, such change will percolate from the bottom up. As in the days of the American Revolution, the anti-slavery movement, the progressive movement, the civil rights movement, the women's movement, the gay rights movement, the climate change movement. From the long view of my life, he concluded, I see how history turns and veers. The end of our country has loomed many times before. America is not as fragile as it seems. I know that Dick was absolutely right in his belief about America. For our government is not some foreign body, it is us. And I believe with all my heart that we are up to that challenge. Thank you so very much.
Thank you.